Well, it's you, you know, it's it's great to have you on here. It's great to get to chat. I have obviously got to chat with you face to face last week, which yeah. which was what kind of like led to this. Now, I rudely for anyone who listened, you'll be like, that was very rude of you to say say this. I was sat having lunch with Rach, and I was like, uh, she was Just saying some, she was saying she was saying some absolutely like clear, I mean easily the most interesting conversation I had that day and my actions wouldn't maybe not suggest they were the, it was the most in, um, interesting conversation I had that day because I was like can you just stop you there is there any chance you can just stop talking <laughs> um and the reason being is because I was like I want to talk about this in front of the community and I want, if that's cool with you. And I wanted to, uh, I wanted my reaction to be genuine. I didn't want it to be like, because otherwise what would have happened? I don't like faking reactions. So what would have happened is you'd be, I'd be like, can you just tell me what you told me last week? And you'd be like, yeah, it's this. And I'd be sat here just like stony face, not doing anything. And people are like, <laughs> were listening to it be like, what's wrong with him? Is he so desensitized to the chaos of the world that he has no emotions left? So I decided that, I wanted to dig into each all of those things, and I wanted to hear all of those things. But I wanted to do, I wanted to hear all of those things for the first time in front of the chat. So before we get into all of that stuff, can you give us a little a little introduction to who you are? Like you introduce all yourself. Week thinking about this. Introduce yourself like you would to you like you'd introduce me at a networking meeting. See, no, because then I lead with I'm a mum of two, which is like a core part of my identity these days. Okay, lead with that um, <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so I am just mum, also known as Rachel. I am a mum of two with a big age gap. So we have seven years between our children, which is a very interesting dynamic, um, to put it politely. Yeah. And I work in business these days, so business support and events. So lots of marketing, lots of events. If you ask my daughter, I drink tea, have my photo taken, apart from on Fridays when I get to drink wine, although I don't work Fridays. So now she knows about corporate Thursdays. <laughs> uh, so anybody outside of the corporate circle doesn't necessarily know, but we do all of our alcohol-based events on a Thursday so that people can book the Friday off to have a hangover. Oh. So that's, the, that's why big events and awards ceremonies and things tend to happen midweek. Um, I have never had a hangover. Never. I've tried. I went to uni twice. Still tried. Didn't get one. Um, that's that's and, probably good. <laughs> no, do you know what? I spent all of uni pining after a hangover so I could, so, so I could, you know, sympathise and em em empathise. That doesn't sound right. Empathise is the right word. In my house and in my dorms, and I never got one. I was the annoying person at like when we got home at 4am that at 6am was like coffee everybody do you want breakfast we're going out it's sunny come on <laughs> um but yeah I, I went to uni twice I did a master's degree straight after my undergrad and I am a bar accredited expert witness for forensic psychology by training so completely different to what I do for work and I suppose I should leave it there because otherwise we'll have nothing to talk about well I'm sure we'll have plenty of things of we'll have plenty of things to talk about so well let's talk about let's start with talking about forensic psychology why the interest um, I am a complete and utter true crime nerd <laughs> and a not true crime nerd as well. So if it's criminal minds, criminal minds is probably the closest to what I'm trained to do. I'm going to take this off because it's really distracting me. Sorry. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so if you watch criminal minds, which for anybody that doesn't know is about the behavioral analysis unit of the FBI in America, that is the closest you'll get to the side of forensic psychology that I'm trained in. So it is a little bit like criminal profiling. And originally I was going to do sports psychology because my dad um, was the performance director for Team GB Paralympic target shooting and did all of the Team GB development stuff and always had. And I was really interested in like the Chimp Paradox books. And I've met that Steve guy. I love you. Yeah, he was my ex-husband's sports psychologist for a while. <laughs> more fool him. <laughs> Fair did enough. try to give him warning. <laughs> Didn't work. Um so I was going to do sports and then I was working in a safe house, which we'll come to, having worked in rehab. And I thought, you know what, I'll just indulge my obsession with crime and I'll do forensics. So I was the only person in a cohort of 12 that had any industry experience and was currently working full time whilst doing my master's in a related field. So the industry experience came first. Yeah. So how I fell into working in rehab is a funny story. Go on. Um, 
Well, we'll get on to the whole Christian cult thing. <laughs> there's, by the way, there's, there's, this is going to be about four or five different topics. Whether or not they're related and there's a common theme, I have no idea. But The common theme is me. The common theme is you. Okay, there we go. My We've... ability to fall into these situations. So yeah, I essentially fell into what would deem itself a Pentecostal church, but essentially got outed as a cult okay. um, as a preteen, early teenager. And I got a job working in the rehab facility that they had for women with life controlling issues. Um, because in the kind of Pentecostal church, a lot of churches, you will share what they would call testimonies, which is where you say or experience whichever celestial being you, ex you believe in, obviously intervening in situations in your life. And I was asked to speak to the women at 18 about my experience with intrusive thoughts, which were, weren't resolved in the slightest um, and probably still aren't because I still have quite a lot of very intrusive thoughts, some funny, some not so funny. Um, and yeah, they asked me to give my testimony to the women in the house and then were like, oh, do you want to come and work a sleepover shift? And then I never left. <laughs> right. I worked there then for nearly three years and then took over some of the safe house stuff so that's working with victims of human trafficking so do we need to step back even one step further to talk about how you got involved in the church in the first place <laughs> sure it sounds really awful when i say my friend introduced me and she wasn't like knee deep in it at all my friend has the ability to stay very surface level with lots of people right. and that's how she likes life she is she has deep connections with very few people and very surface level and she's very good at saying what people want to hear I am not. <laughs> I talk too much just to say what people want to hear. Um, so she was like, oh, come down to this youth group. It's great. You know, we'll have a laugh. You can meet some people. And, and that was it. And she kind of dipped in and out as and when she pleased and did all of the ungodly behaviors that they were trying to teach us all against. <laughs> um, and I dipped my toe in and got sucked in like a whirlpool and ended up um, running the kids church for them in Newcastle so every week I went to Newcastle for 18 months until that was pulled from under my feet because they didn't like somebody that I had been seeing um, so they arranged for somebody else to take over and then didn't tell me I just got told in the car on the way home and I ran the kids stuff in Yorkshire for a while the multi-congregational which is why it's all over the place they tried to send me to Ghana at one point um, later down the line, as I started trying to ease myself out, they tried to send me to Ghana because they'd started a church in a safe house there and um, told me God was calling me to Ghana. And I said, if God was calling me to Ghana, I think he'd tell me first. <laughs> <laughs> Did not feel called to Ghana in the slightest, no. especially after the experience another one of my friends had there. And I was just like, no, my heart does not say, let's go to Ghana. So, and yeah. On. As I, well, so, you know, what, what sort of tools or behaviors did they use to essentially not it's indoctrinate, about, but like get you more and deeper involved? So it's a lot of, they complement the stuff that they like to see, obviously. And it works best on damaged youth. Not to say that I was damaged. I had a very plain upbringing, but I never really kept friends. I was very much too much to pe for people. And they slowly train that out of me. But, you know, they when I say church, you don't need to imagine a, a building with a steeple and pews. We're talking a conference centre with smoke machines, electric guitars, drums behind screens, a full roster of singers, which I did join to in to the middle of my time there. Big name speakers, pop artists coming through the door. I mean, we had um, a guy called Elliot Kennedy. So anybody involved in music in the UK will know who Elliot Kennedy is. He was the producer for the Spice Girls, Westlife and things like that, wrote a lot of their songs. He actually lives in Sheffield. Right. Um, so they would entice these big money givers essentially into the church, keep people there that had passions that aligned with that. So they could obviously... I mean, romance them sounds a bit weird, but, you know, to entice them to stay because there's people there that have common knowledge and things like that. I'm very lucky that the job my dad did outside of shooting um, when I was younger, men, I knew a lot of celebrities from the music circuit. I knew Richard Branson. I, you know, you go and hang out at his house if you work for Virgin. It's quite fun. Um <laughs> And then he brought with him one of Charlie's angels. So Lucy Liu used to come to the church. Really? Yeah. She's really little, but she's really pretty. <laughs> 
and they flatter them because they let them sit on the front row. Front row of church is, is front row. Yeah. If you're allowed to sit on the front row, you've got the look. You worship properly. You're in it. You know the words. <laughs> it is mental. So it what is- would you say separated them from like and, and categorize them as a cult and why they were ended up out, outing for cultish <laughs> behaviors compared to Ooh. any other pentecostal church it's very mad i mean tongues is a common pentecostal thing so anybody that doesn't know um i always presume that even a lot of church going christians don't know about the experience of tongues tongues is essentially where you speak in what is believed to be some kind of celestial language yep whilst praying and you know if you get given the gift of tongues you are well in there and the minute you even babble during prayer sessions which are held in a circle not quite holding hands but you are facing each other and you can feel people staring at you whilst you're doing this waiting for you to speak in tongues you are celebrated they will lord people they will choose people if you sit on the front row you're famed you're loved if you look after leaders kids that's great like one of the biggest things they could let you do is clean the pastor's house. So they had a massive four bedroom house. They did not need a cleaner. It was always clean. But people from their Bible Academy and people from the congregation that were trusted enough got to go and clean their house. <laughs> yeah. And it's all for free. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I figured that much. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so clean leaders houses going to, uh, going to other congregations, being trusted with other congregations to lead and nurture them. They do cell groups, which again, are more of a modern phenomenon, but it's where you get small group meetings in houses generally. Um, so lots of people have heard of the Alpha course. It's a bit like that, but on roids. Right. So it's people coming together to talk about their experience of the week and where they've seen God in their life. And you just, it's very fluffy. <laughs> It's very nice and co- and it's nice. Everybody likes everybody. Everybody likes you. Everybody's your best friend. So, Until you turn 21 and you're still single, because that is just danger territory. Right. <laughs> so, Christian shell. Like, looking back, how did you get kind of entered in deeper, you know shall we say? I'm, I'm trying to find the, the right word for that. <laughs> this is the thing. I was a very lonely child. So, I grew up as very much a tomboy. You'd, you'd forgiven for not thinking that now, but I grew up very much as a tomboy. My mum had cancer. We didn't know how serious it was until I was 22. And somebody else finally told me about all the weekends when I was at the shooting range, just because we thought mum was going to die that weekend. Right. And we didn't want me to be at home. Um, you know, I still find it very hard to think that people don't like me. I do spend a lot of time thinking people don't like me. So it eases my social anxiety to know that people do like you and people care and they message you first and they're very hands on with you until they palm you off to the next person, the next stage in the ladder. So they've got the welcome committee. So generally in youth, they've got youth pastors and they'll have a group of sort of late teens, maybe early 20s that they trust with the youth that can give them this great impression that, you know, joining this church makes you really prosper. You're going to get the financial prosperity that you want. You're going to get the fame and acclaim that you deserve and that is written for you in the Bible. (laughs) You know, and you're all going to live this great star-studded life and jet around the world and preach and enjoy everything. So I was very lonely. So to feel wanted by a group was very powerful. Hmm. Now I don't care. As an adult, I'm just like, no, it's okay. I've got my bubble. You're not in it. Bye. So, so this led into obviously you work you working for the safe house. What? Yes, I started off in rehab. So they had a rehab facility which. Um, I won't say the name of because they have been investigated and on Channel 4 and stuff. I mean, if you really wanted to find it, you could. But I was a whistleblower, so I don't want to (laughs) test too much. Um, And basically, life-controlling issues for them meant unplanned pregnancy, depression, eating disorders, um, which is kind of like the lighter side of the work there. And it did go through to, you know, ritual abuse, um, flashbacks, things where people were self-injuring to extreme extents to say that we weren't medically trained uh, coming off of highly controlled addictive substances which 18 issuing methadone to people is a bit extreme mm-hmm. um, so I worked there and I worked there originally as a volunteer eventually I was I was blessed with a paid position where you get paid for between 12 and 20 hours a week but you are expected to be on call full time so I used to do three or four sleep shifts a week which you don't really sleep in because you're too busy worrying if somebody's gonna you know come into your room and be hovering over you Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the night 
and issuing medication, supervising medical trips, yeah, having to deal with flashbacks and lots of uh, post-trauma behaviours. I won't say PTSD because they're very different. Okay. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, at 19, I was dealing with girls that had stolen scissors from their work experience placement and were injuring themselves, people that were locking themselves in places where they thought we couldn't find them, trying to sneak off. The first time I took a group of girls to the shop, and I say girls because these were young girls, these weren't the older residents, um, I didn't, I hadn't been told that they weren't to have their own purses, so they didn't have any money or anything when they were in the property, and when you went to the shop, I wasn't told that they didn't get to handle the money and pay themselves mm -hmm. and one of them snuck off with their purse bought a bottle of vodka and the next day was hanging and had to admit that she'd taken her purse from me and abused the fact that I was a new staff member and hadn't had proper training and um yeah she bought a bottle of vodka and got drunk in her room after lights out so it's a bit extreme I had one there's a culture of writing people up which I think people always think is just a prison thing um but yeah, they are, there is the encouragement to report negative behaviour from the other women and staff. So I was written up for leaving a cheese grater next to the sink when I was at the fridge right. rather than holding it mm -hmm. because it was very triggering. Um, I was very quickly found to be the one with actual experience in psychology. So I was put on the toughest cases, um, which is extreme. But it did, it did help that I had an slight obsession with ritualistic and serial abuse and things like that so that really came into play there and I think that's why they kept me to be honest right how did the the people that were I mean the, the, the people using this safe house um what I don't know what word you use them patients say you know customers Res, re, service for the users, rehab residents, it's residents, residents yeah okay. and then for safe house it's um, um how, so there's two questions I want to kind of really ask about this is, is it from a logistical point of view, really, which is how did they become residents of the safe house? Was it people from within the church that? No. No? OK. So there is there is a couple of faith based rehabilitation projects in the UK okay. and further afield. Um, so one big one is called the Mercy Project. So Mercy is full time residential care, similar to what we were in, but it is more. Um, it isn't city based so they would be out and they'd be you know tending like in some of the mercy projects they'd be out tending fields and they'd be looking after animals and things like that so a lot of women bounce from project to project so things like eating disorders substance use and abuse you know these are in-depth things that people without psychological training are not in the position to cure you from mm -hmm. um so they would just bounce project to project they'd, they'd end up at us because we were a last resort um, the way we were financed was different and we were a zero tolerance rehab. So if you were on methadone, usually if you go on to methadone, you wean down to quite a low dose, but you will on, be on it for a substantial amount of time. Whereas we would wean girls down and then they'd go to hospital for a week and go cold turkey and then come back. So people ended up there. We did have quite a lot of people come out of prison. So they would be escorted to a train, put on a train, dropped off in the city where we were, picked up by one of us and become a resident so it would be part of their um parole they would have to enter a project and quite often we would just accept them and some it was families had just were just desperate for help mm -hmm. and they found us and it wasn't a particularly in-depth application process there wasn't very many women that they rejected so they'd apply and they'd get bought in so they just get dropped off by their family. So were all of the staff the members of the church? Yes. Right. And no medical training? No. We had one paediatric nurse who kind of dipped in and out. Um, she became properly like a full-time member of staff quite close to when I actually left. So we had a paediatric nurse and one of the um, like board that oversee it is a doctor mm -hmm. in an NHS hospital. But other than that, it is just faith-based experience and love. So was 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 it like prey the addiction away? Like you know, essentially, was it were they trying to treat? How how were they actually trying to rehabilitate people? So you had all your medical appointments that you would have as appropriate. Okay. But then every day there was 
morning prayers, afternoon prayers, there were faith-based sessions and work experience. So essentially it is, you know, study the Bible until you know that you are in the wrong and you correct your behaviour. And guilt, a lot of guilt. Um, Why are you doing this when uh, you've got Given children? the fact that I always say we don't guilt ourselves into greatness, um, please don't prove me wrong. Um, <laughs> like, um, how did that work? Um, I know of one graduate who is mentally well and I use that term lightly um, more lightly than I probably should but I know of one graduate that has gone on to lead a much better life off her own back because she actually after I left she left the church because as part of the program you have to attend church on a Sunday Mm -hmm. you have to undertake a sort of cell group and things like that so one of the graduates um, left the church along with the person she was seeing at the time because there was just so much control over their relationship and they have blossomed, the pair of them, since they left. Another graduate married one of the male members of staff from the other safe house, which I have huge issues with. Um, I just don't think that relationship was right in any way, shape or form. I still don't think it is from what I see on social media. And everybody else that I know of has re- relapsed and went on to further treatment before either feeling well enough to not need treatment or having exhausted 99% of avenues. Right. Um, how did you get out of it? I ran. <laughs> <laughs> I full on ran. So it was graduation week of my master's and I was called into a meeting on the day of my brother's graduation. So after the graduation ceremony, I had to go and see the female lead pastor so the the church was set up by a couple that came over from australia they've now run back to australia following several recent investigations into the church um so i was called into a meeting with her and her right hand woman and essentially berated for two hours whilst my parents and my brother sat in the car park waiting to go for dinner um with the eventual line being once i started to cry oh now you're crying we feel we've seen the real you now we believe you now we think that you you are truthfully faithful now we think that you you are one of us and now that you've cried in front of us and you've shown us this real you we can offer you six months probation on your job so it'll be unpaid probation probationary hours you still need to do all of your duties um but we just needed we just needed to see the real you we think you've been pretending for four years right and i was like i am not that good an actress (laughs) i wear i mean up until last year, I used to mask a lot of my own behaviours, but I know that my face told a different story because quite often I got told it. Um, but yeah, they uh, two hours, over two hours of, but is this the real you? But do you really, but is it, um, and I just I had enough. And then I walked out of there and said, I won't be working tomorrow. And the next day I walked in, I put my notes on the desk and I left. All right. And I've never been back. I've been excommunicated by all uh, of my yeah, I was gonna friends. Say, so how, how did they take that? What was the response to that? Um, I didn't get paid my last paycheck. I didn't get my certificates back that they had held on to. And everybody from the church blocked me on every form of social media and never spoke to me again. By the one person that I know that you know also left and is now mentally thriving. So yeah, it was a brilliant time of life, <laughs> just as I found my ex-husband, and then that's a whole different love story of narcissists. Um, yeah, so I moved from one toxic situation to the other, right. essentially. Based on your experiences, like what's some kind of things that you'd advise other people to look out for? Because the thing is, I and I don't want anyone thinking that we're outright bashing faith in here. Like I have... I I personally don't, I'm an agnostic myself, but I also have a background in various churches, one of which was in Elam, which is a Pentecostal church. And so I know, I know a lot of that. And I don't, um, I don't actually have anything bad to say about faith. I have something, some bad things to say about certain religious people. Religion. Religion. Religion is, so it's essentially like a type of religious love bombing. They will be highly appropriate with you, but they will make you feel wanted and needed with every fibre of their being until you need their approval and you need to ask them before you do things. Um, If you've got a faith, I've got no problem with that. I mean, I do believe in God. I don't practice mostly because I am petrified of reliving a similar experience just in a different format. Um, But I do believe, I do believe in God. I do believe in the whole 
try and put it really like neutrally, like the whole situation. I'm not going to take the Bible as written law, yeah. but I do believe that there is an omnipotent being overseeing um, whether or not it's like the Matrix or what. I don't know. We should get into a deep conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but religion is where it becomes dangerous. And I had this really interesting conversation actually with a student that was there on Wednesday doing the health checks. She's doing some research into whether religion, a person's professed religion, affects their likelihood to uptake treatment of type 2 diabetes. Yeah. And I did my undergraduate dissertation on risk-taking behaviour in self-declaring religious or people who follow a faith during uni and the secret is they all lie <laughs> so essentially i just did an anonymous survey and i collected them in and obviously had to work through hundreds of surveys because it was a massive church and i did a couple of other churches and essentially those that had been raised or were in it for religion's purpose and by that i mean you know they are book-led christians or they've always gone to church because mum and grandma went to church and that's what they do and they have to keep it up mm-hmm. Their experience is very different to somebody who will call themselves faith rather than religious. Right. So faith is far more intrinsic. You live that. So a lot of people in that church do have faith. They are led by their faith and their own beliefs. And, you know, they're not they are not the people that are standing there at first fruits giving you five thousand pound pledges. Mm. They are the people that are there saying, Do you know what? I tithe, I give what I can, but I'm not going to over pledge myself because I'm not going to test God and say, I'm going to pledge £5,000 and God is going to provide that for me. Because that is the attitude, that is the the prosperity teachings that that kind of church has. And I mean, they had this plan to buy the land next to where their warehouse was and they were going to build this huge, I mean, they've called them mega centre anyway. So if you're in Liverpool, you'll know that Liverpool have a mega centre. They all call them all mega centres. I didn't um, actually know. I've probably driven past it plenty of times. <laughs> <laughs> it's like way out on a... You have to walk down a really rough street to get there from the centre of Liverpool. Oh, yeah, look, I'm from Liverpool. They're all really rough streets. Oh, they're not just all been, really rough. I've just, I no, they're not. Liverpool. It's a lovely... Liverpool's a great place. I was just... I was just trying to get myself cancelled by my own kin. <laughs> All the scousers come out of the woodwork like, no. Dave, we've had um, enough for you. You're done. Yeah. <laughs> You're finished, lad. <laughs> like, get out. Uh, yeah, so the people that are faith is a very different experience to the smoke machines and the electric guitars and the cameras and the God TV recordings and the Elliot Kennedy shows and over-promising yourself and overstretching yourself. It's very different. Yeah. So Absolutely. you say obviously love love bombing being one of the things to look love out for. Like if someone yeah. is if people they are, are overly like treating you Familiar. like the greatest thing on the face of the planet. Yeah. And it, yeah, oh, it was it's, great. They always need you and they need your opinion and they want to give you things and they'll like give you books and teachings from the preacher and they'll introduce you to people and I've got loads of dust flying around me. I'm sorry, my house is dusty. <laughs> sorry, I got really distracted Don't even then by get this. Don't me started, and I just see this. This this room is honestly. I feel like this looks like a fake background, and I can't work out why. Mm. But this is my. You're room you're house. more. It's because of the. It's because you have, have you got a ring light on or something? Because you've got. I've got a lamp on. Yeah, you're more. If I you're, didn't, you're much more. Yeah, that's there we a bit go. Dreary look. Yeah, so you're, like you're, you're 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 nice and separated from the background, which is feel... which is good. It's a good. It's it's how it should be, <laughs> apparently. Um, okay, so anything else before we move on from there for, of what people can look out for? Because again, if someone you know, if someone finds themselves it in is, a church environment, it or... is really difficult. And I would say that if you are looking for the faith based support, you don't necessarily want to go to a bells and whistles pentecostal pop church and we call them like a lot of people call them pop churches because i mean they write some really catchy songs there's some great songs i still remember lots of the songs um and raps you don't want to you don't want a church that raps (laughs) not as your first church i mean if i hear my god is big somebody get your praise on my head instantly starts going because it's catchy but it's probably not the environment that you're looking for if you're exploring your faith and the possibility of structured religion being for you and you want somewhere that is far more take you as you are and leave you if you want to be left because these people will hound you they will be concerned for your welfare Mm. (laughs) they will be all over you like the metaphorical religious rash yeah (laughs) 
that is the big and it's super hard because it is hard to know when somebody's genuinely enjoying your company and just wants to give you that little bit more of themselves so you feel welcome but yeah. these guys take it that step further and they you know there's starbucks starbucks is the the yuppie church is like there is a starbucks in the mega center <laughs> in sheffield they have their own starbucks franchise to run starbucks on a sunday for church um you know they're going to want to be taking you for coffee they won't let you pay and it's like typical love bombing and that's the only way you can really describe it which is a bit scary yeah and it it is it is tough because the thing is that like genuine communities use a lot of the same i know i'm 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 reluctant to call them call them tools but it's like okay one thing i'm thinking like when with our with our mod team and stuff in, in twitch it's like okay well we want to be welcoming like my mods like my mods you know know to if especially if i'm in podcast mode and i can't talk directly to chat you know, this like make make sure people feel welcome. And the other thing I'll say when new people come into the chat is like, look, we we want. In fact, even it it does all sound a bit cultish. We we have the word ethical, you know, ethical cult. It's um, true, and I mean because we're like we want you to be part of the family. Like I'm, I just want people, people to feel welcome. Have their um, their boundaries, and they're all set in very different places. I've just seen Blush say in chat about an LGBTQIA plus church, and it is so right. If you see some a church where they have a front row culture they have all of their students sat together all of their youth sat together all of the kids sat together if they have a project like the the safe house if all of those people are sat together and you are directed where to sit that for me is just i don't i want to sit where i want to sit i want to meet new people i don't want to be sat next to the person who's in my lectures monday to friday or the kid that i look after you know two weekends a month i want to be able to sit with a diverse range of people i don't want to see a church where it's like oh look and our black singer is on stage today. Let's all clap. Mm. I don't want to be in a church where they're telling the singers that they need to wear sanitary towels under their arms to stop sweat creeping through their T-shirt or that they need to eat a certain way because they're overweight or looking at other things. <laughs> There's lots of little things to unpack, but I mean, they're not all my story, so yeah. But yeah, I don't want to be in a church that's going to control that, you know, women have to wear heels. Nowhere in my Bible does it say that in the year 2023, if my feet are sore, I have to cram them into a pair of stilettos and walk down the hill to church. I think it's in Leviticus. (laughs) Well, you know, (laughs) Leviticus always makes me laugh because it's quoted in six. It's quoted in what? Six, in the musical Six. So it's a a comedy musical that was written for Edinburgh Fringe, which is now Mm. a touring musical. And it's about Henry VIII's six wives. Um. And the first wife says... um, Henry VIII's first wife was married to his brother before him, right. but his brother died, so he married her out of basically it was convenient, and you know she was all right. And it'll do. <laughs> and there's a line in her song that says, um, "It's that it's about being in Leviticus that because she was married before she'll end up hideous all of her life." I'm gonna have to Google what it. The exact <laughs> line. Fair enough. So after after leaving the safe, I was handing the notes and leave, disappearing. Um, everyone excommunicating you, all of that. What what was next for you? I moved in with my now ex husband, and he's now an ex for a very good reason. <laughs> Do you want to get into that? Um, very much the same behaviours. <laughs> I was love bombed, and I was secured, and I was belittled in exactly the right way for me to feel like I needed his approval. And then after a couple of years, we had my eldest, who is, she turned nine a couple of weekends ago, and things went from bad to worse, and eventually I managed to run away after several failed attempts whilst he was sleeping with his now fiancé in my house. But he bought me a carpet cleaner and a phone, so, you know, it's 100% all right. Yeah, (laughs) that seems balanced. Um, I want to kind of touch on something you said there. What What are some of the similarities between kind of the way... Um, a cult would work and the way a manipulative partner or i, I mean technically yeah. I, sound I, I don't want to throw the he's psychopath word around or oh, nice narcissist no, he's okay he's a narcissist yeah he yeah. is textbook if you look up narcissist you'll probably find his name <laughs> um especially if it's like written by me no he is and it's one of these things as a psychology graduate especially a double psych graduate everyone goes did you not see the warning signs did yeah. you not know? And I'm like, hmm, funny that. Because if it worked like that and you had the introspection to be like, hang on a minute, I read about this, 
you wouldn't get so lost in it, but you also probably wouldn't fall in romantic love ever because you know there are little this, bits. This this is why I blur I'm, the line. I'm, yeah, this is why I, this is why people often ask me what are my red flags, and I'm like, this I don't actually have red flags. I have I I nearly did for a little while after a couple of oh, dodgy I relationships. I have two big ones. Go on. Don't tell me what I can wear, and don't tell me what I can eat. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, because I was just. Hmm. But my but my wife like tells me what I can wear all the time. And yeah. she's got really good fashion advice, <laughs> and I I've now got Stockholm syndrome. I will tap on the <laughs> microphone three times if, if I'm in trouble. Um, like, but, like, in certain situations, okay, but don't like the, I don't want to get up in the morning and be told that I can't go out wearing that because well, it doesn't look right for him. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is the difference as well. Is like I I make I make that comment, but like like. <laughs> actually there's a couple of shirts that like now specifically alone will be like you're not going out wearing that i'm like i am and she's just the like stitch shirt. You should the, wear stitch the stitch shirt, shirt is one of them more. and the other one's on the way it's not it here. you it, yeah it, if anyone was paying attention to my instagram story about a week ago I, oh no now i feel like i need to oh you're stalk. gonna love it you're gonna love it it's coming from america it said it would be 10 to 15 days and i ordered it about 10 you days you can't ago. see it but this jumper this jumper i would never usually buy myself ryan my partner who on twitch is cranky dad you'll never see him in here because he doesn't like admitting he has mental health um <laughs> or any kind of health this is a super mario themed mum jumper and it says super mamio love it and it's got like the little toads and everything absolutely adore it. i will go out looking like an idiot quite happily i will let my children dress me they can pick they can't pick my makeup i'm a bit funny about my makeup quite often because i don't usually wear any but i will let my my daughter pick my clothes i want to um, circle back to what you said before about like you know if people didn't fall for it they'd, they'd never fall in love and this is this this is one yeah. this is one of those key things is the fact that why a lot of times when people have been in a, in a relationship where things have gone wrong we we overcompensate and then we become too guarded the opposite way which is why i t- i say you know i i I, if, I probably do have red flags but they're just so bloody obvious that <laughs> yeah. like that that it's just like no it's not even a warning sign yeah, it's ex- gone ex- before that ex- ex- like it's exactly finished, yeah. It's yeah so i tend to say that i've got amber flags and my amber flags it basically is like proceed with caution it's like okay this let's keep an eye on this and see where it develops and and it's um, for me. I, I don't have to use that. You know, I've been in a relationship for thirteen years now, so I don't actually have to use that in a in a dating sense. But I have to use it in a moderate my, massive, in friend, friendships and and moderating my community. So like, like, I have to be honest. I probably wouldn't be my own friend because I talk so much. What? And I have zero boundary. Yeah, I talk about everything now. Well, that's what's that's wrong the big with thing that? about coming back to it because I in lockdown because I started going through the whole ADHD diagnosis thing and having to look at myself. Mm-hmm. And I suddenly realized how much of my energy I spent on meeting everybody else's expectations and masking. And it's particularly my ex-husband. Um, there was a lot of time spent. I mean, I was 14 stone when I met him. I'm a lot heavier than that now. And at one point I was less than 10 and a half stone and looked skeletal. I mean, I'm broad framed. My whole family are broad framed. I'm not made to be 10 stone or less. And I was tiny before I had our daughter and a big thing for him was I really struggled to lose weight after I had her um but I I lost a significant amount of weight in less than six months because I was told that I needed to and I find it really weird now because my partner now um is just like what are you eating are we having a takeaway are you having chocolate what chocolate do you want what wine do you want why don't you have some more here food (laughs) and I find it really unusual and even now when I ask about clothes he's like just wear what you want and I sometimes still crave that structure of being told oh actually no that's not appropriate for today whereas I'm just my mental load is halved because I just don't care anymore (laughs) yeah it's fun but I end up talking like this, so please tell me to shut it, up. No, I, I, you've, you've seen me do enough of these to know that I actually prefer it when people talk more. That's my, that's my favourite oh, no. type of interview. I just get to sit here and listen. I don't have to do much work. Uh, I'm, I'm, After I'm in this, I'll be sat here going, I talked enough. I, I. I'm very good at concealing just how lazy I am. <laughs> it's like, well, you put so much work out, yes, but I'm tremendously lazy. I call it selectively lazy. If I had a if I had a packet of uh, cherry bake rolls and a packet of apple pies, and the oh, apple pies, yeah, cherry bake rolls are the best. And if I if the apple pies were on top, 
the box was on top of the cherry bake wells and I really wanted the cherry bake well, I'd still eat a cherry pie, an apple pie because I've got to take the box off to get to the other one. It's like, we cut like, because like Alona used to read for, for, for to it. She's like, she's like, that's just really lazy. I'm like, it's selectively lazy though, isn't it? Because I do a load of other stuff. Like, I, you know, get to the gym at like six o'clock in the morning. That You can't call a person lazy if they do that. It's like, but I am very selectively lazy. And, um, I'm but what, not lazy. I'm so, just very selective with what tasks I actually complete. <laughs> well, that's the ADHD for you. But, um, <laughs> but circling but back to, to that, um, circling back to that again, is that I think that that during lockdown period did te- did we're, we're, especially within the neurodiverse or mental health or, or disabled communities, it was like, hang on a minute, the world's working better for us in this situation. I loved it. It came at a really good time for us because we moved house we got the keys at the end of january we moved in the first week of february on the day we officially moved in i broke my elbow um, because i fell down the stairs that i'd managed not to fall down for an entire year in the flat taking the last bag of rubbish out i fell down which is a funny story in itself um turned out i broke my elbow found out like 12 hours later sounds, when i was sat in a that doesn't sound very humorous <laughs> Joe, i've got a nice big scar now I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Like it runs oh, yeah. from okay. down here oh. to like up here. I can see the so top of the the bit of it above your elbow. I know the light. You, 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 you had a shiny forearm. <laughs> uh, I can't even turn my arm in the right direction. But yeah, it starts down that here and it goes all the way up. I got two pins in there because I did such a good job at breaking it. They gave me two. Well, if you're going to do something, do it properly, right? I know. The first time I officially broke a bone, I've chipped a bone before at a wedding reception. <laughs> <laughs> I always do things in the best scenarios. Like I fell over and I was like, oh, that hurt. And the next day I was like, mmm, <laughs> it's not the right colour. <laughs> anyway, so I fell down the stairs, eventually went to A&E and I broke my elbow. So I couldn't work. Um, I couldn't drive my car, I couldn't do anything really because I was in a pot from my armpit to my fingertips for a week until I had surgery. Um, and we'd literally, that day was the day we'd officially moved in. Obviously, I've got my daughter as well and we were moving in here. Um, so we had the time when he was working nights I was basically taking far too many prescription strength painkillers just to get through the day and I was like taking the bus and taxis to get my daughter to school and then lockdown happened and the three of us had to spend all this time together because his contracting stopped because contractors were considered non-essential staff I couldn't work I'd gone back to work and within like a week it was like oh by the way we're closing schools because there's a and there's a virus that we need to nip in the bud. It'll only be for a couple of weeks. And school closed. So we were forced together. And it was probably the best thing that could have happened for the three of us, given my daughter's situation with her dad, which isn't great. Right. Um, but yeah, so we we thrived in lockdown. And Ryan spent the whole time going, do you know what? There's so much about you that I didn't know that you don't show me, but I absolutely love. Like, why don't you do this more? Why aren't you more like this? Why are you so guarded? And I was just like, oh, yeah, no, I can't be bothered doing all that again. <laughs> Going through it's, all that. It's been a lot. Yeah. Although, it, I have to laugh. Even though we look at each other every day, in the face, square in the face, he had never noticed until yesterday that I have a quarter brown eye. You have a quarter Sorry. brown eye? I do. Like, if I come a bit closer, you can see on this eye. I will zoom in on that later. It's not quite... I, there's some pictures I can put in the Discord where it really shows up. Yeah. And that actually, in lockdown, was the first time that I learned to love that about myself. Because um, I got really angry because Snapchat filters, get rid of it. Oh, like so, in- so that's interesting. I don't, I don't think I've ever heard of someone getting angry because Snapchat yeah. got rid of something that it deems Which to be an talk- imperfection. Yeah, but- so lots of people think it's a flaw and I have to be like, oh yeah, I did hurt my eye when I was a kid, but I was born with this and it, it used to change size and fluctuate and now it doesn't as an adult. Um, and they was like, oh, did, you, did something hit you in the eye when you were a kid or did is, is that some recent thing? And like, I've had teachers ask me if that's why I need glasses. I've had them ask me if I can't see because of it. And actually, it's just a colour thing. It's called sectoral heterochromia. I can't stop looking at myself now. Yeah, well, I, know, um, I was going to say, I know that when people have got two, <laughs> two different coloured eyes, it's called het- het- heterochromia. But like, so sectoral being a sector of one of them. Yeah. yeah. And sense. it's completely different to Madeleine McCann because when I was younger and much blonder without the highlights, people are like, oh my God, is that what Madeleine McCann has? I'm like, no. Are you sure you're not Madeleine McCann? Yeah. Well, she has, hers is actually a section that is void of colour. So you're seeing through her coloured section there. Ah. Whereas this is a section that is a different colour. Right. 
Okie dokes. So I'm the only person I've ever met. Uh, you, that was, this is the with, first time I've ever a, heard of him. A, with a section. But yeah, he had, he'd never noticed. And he was like, oh my God, I can't have never noticed these things about you. But there's still stuff I say, and I say it really casually, but he's like, um, circle back, because that's not a normal comment to make. <laughs> After that, Ooh, sorry. So, what happened next for you work wise after that point? Like, so obviously, you'd worked in this rehab center. Yeah, so when I ran and ran her, I started applying for jobs in a similar position. The problem being that the charity that I was working for wasn't doing things strictly right. And that's something I missed out saying from that two and a bit hour grilling was they told me I was being too legalistic about things. Right. Bearing in mind that I was studying forensic psychology, which is I, I only have to do like two years work in a law firm and I can be a barrister. Okay. So I was I was pretty well versed in English law and I'd done all my research and I was saying, you're not doing this right, you're not following it. You're too legalistic, God's got it all in his hands, don't worry. So I applied for non-faith-based positions, didn't get any of them. And then some more of them would have meant moving a significant distance away. Um but I met my ex-husband and was convinced that, you know, West Yorkshire was the place to be. So I moved here and I've been here ever since. Started a Twitter campaign to try and get a job um, because he wasn't keen on me working in any of the cities, um, even Leeds, even though it's really close to us, because it was just too dangerous. And um, got a tweet back from the then chief exec of where I am now, even though I've left in between. Um, saying, oh, go on, make it one more today. Send me your CV. Mm -hmm. So I did. And he created a job for me. Yay. <laughs> All because I didn't want to work in McDonald's. No offence to anybody that works in McDonald's. You're a very valuable member of society. I wholeheartedly appreciate the work that you do. <laughs> I wholeheartedly appreciate. Yeah, I was going to say I wholeheartedly appreciate the work you do as well. And it's not your fault that the milkshake machine is hardly ever working. I know. What is with that? Because the milkshake after. might bring all the boys to the yard, but when the machine's not working, and I'm already it in the brings yard. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> no, it brings me there because you don't. You're already in the yard. And they don't tell you before you try and order. Like at the drive-through, they don't. They've got. These screens, they could put on the screen. Sorry, our milkshake machine isn't working. Or our phone machine I'm already in the queue by that point, so... I know, I think you're, you're committed. I think it's because at that point morning. I am committed and I'm going to have probably 20 nuggets by that point. Oh, <laughs> it's like, good choice. Because. They've got cheese sticks at the minute. Oh, yeah, I know. Oh, <laughs> and cream egg McFlurries, which is just dangerous. Oh, I've not had a, anyway. oh, I've not had a cream egg McFlurry yet this year. Oh, I need to get one before like Easter's over. Um, I think we've got like another two weeks. We're, we're not. We're not going to just both tangent together. So, so <laughs> is there any more? So, so is that was that the end of the work in any forensic psychology related? So, I've done some consulting since. So, my degree, unlike most forensic psychology degrees, my degree isn't aimed at working in a prison. And I have served my time metaphorically, <laughs> working with people currently in the system, on both sides of offenders and victims coming through the relevant houses. Um, so I was like, I don't want to work in a prison. I want to essentially do what Criminal Minds is. If anybody's seen Criminal Minds, it's, it's glorious. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I get the feeling you kind of love it. I've never oh, actually watched I love it. it. I mean, mum watches it's it. Mild, mild obsession with Matthew Gray Goobler. Mild obsession. He's, oh, honestly. I'll be Googling like him the while antithesis, you go The antithesis of my current partner, which makes me laugh. But yeah, Anyway, so it's criminal profiling. So working with the police to look at, blood, sorry, I've just seen Blush say in the chat that she loves criminal minds. See, I knew we were on the same page. <laughs> um, so it's working with the investigations. How do you question somebody to get the right answers out of them or to get the truth out of them, I should say? How do you approach a situation to understand what's really going on, what factors are at play, do video games cause violence, you know, things like that, that kind of thing. And then studying like stalking behaviours and trying to get to the root with a victim. How do you go from victim to perpetrator and how do you track that relationship? Um, and a little bit of handwriting analysis is total quack science, but it's hilarious when you tell people you can do it. And then giving testimony. So I'm an expert witness. So at the point of qualification, I could have stood up in court as a forensic psychologist and said, because of X, Y, Z, 
QPR must be right and therefore they are or are not guilty. Yeah. So you've gone so, from yeah. testimony to testimony. It's like, yeah. um, I, well, again, again, I want to pick up on Fair one enough. thing you've just said then. And it's something that I see a lot in, well, non-forensic psychology, I guess, is when you say, how do you go from victim to perpetrator? Yeah, like, how do you track that? Well, uh, right, so <laughs> what, okay, what, what can you talk about the... Because there's there's this I can never remember so the name much. of it, but there's there's a like there's a little there's a triangle in psychology which is I can't remember what it's called, but it basically has victim to savior to per victim to persecutor to savior like this little triangle of which people move through within relationships and yeah. particularly unhealthy relationships and how we love triangles in psychology yeah we love anything with three sides anything, it's brilliant anything with points <laughs> it has to be three it, it has, has to, to be, be three. three well it's so like Beck's, it's, Beck's triad in um in, in depression is, is is three and it's and it tracks tracks really well the idea of you it, needing a belief about yourself a belief about the world and a belief about the future combine those three things as a negative belief and it's the it's one of the it's basically like the, the perfect so you storm go to, depression you go to that i go to setting fires hurting animals and wetting the bed and you've got a psychopath so you know that's that's my that's my three of instinct right. <laughs> they're the three behaviors that you look for in in somebody's youth to to lead you towards more violent crimes really and a lack of empathy, yeah. So they set fires because they're testing boundaries and they want to see what happens. Generally, they're malicious, but they don't cause too much harm. So they might damage a building, but they wouldn't put people at risk. Right. They would capture animals. So they might set traps for mice and rats or birds, and then they cause them harm. And yeah, generally, there's a lot of historical trauma, so they wet the bed. So, you know... <laughs> Not that I'm trying to set anybody off down the path, but no. that's one of the triads we look for. So, so we if, would. If so you with you the crime, the bed, like that's stalking. fine, but just don't go torturing animals, and you're okay. No. Or set. Or, or set don't, don't, don't set any fires. <laughs> Unless like, it's a barbecue. One of those three things is out of your control. The other two things, yeah. you know. Yes. Yeah, it's all about choices ultimately, and this is something I try and instill in my kids. Like our, most of our behaviours, but not all our choices. Yeah. So some are physically led some uh, autonomic but some behaviors particularly negative behaviors tend to be choices um but with crimes like stalking most stalkers are people that you already know well if not family members well, so there's an obvious joke there it's too obvious <laughs> it's like yeah yeah well they definitely know you <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know it's family members it's romantic partners or people that have shown romantic interest in you it's close friends it's very very rare that you get a true stranger stalker hmm. so then you start looking at um what they call circles so you, every person is the middle of a circle yeah then you have your sort of core so that would be your immediate family your current romantic partners any children and then you have a step out from that so that is your more distant family your closest acquaintances and you keep moving out so you would track through the circles to see where the links come through it's like a maze i love it so to pick it all apart going back to that question how does a victim become a perpetrator you know it's really it is hard because there are so many victims that don't and that's and, yeah, where and, psychology struggles, because you can't say that X happened to this person, so they are now going to commit that crime or anything against another person themselves. There is no, in that way, there is no causal link. If you look at the nature versus nurture argument, both sides are completely null and void because you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. But generally, offending behavior is learnt. And it goes on, I always call them broken toys, um, like broken love maps is a really common one. So for, for cases where it's sort of ritualistic abuse against loved ones, for example, so that would be um, the more extreme end of that. Um, I don't want to get really graphic, but it's really hard to say in it without sounding quite graphic. Tem <laughs> temporary graphic detail allowance, anybody who's tenure to skip ahead. 35 well skip ahead a yeah. minute like from here yeah. if you're watching live mute me for like a minute go yeah so um yeah it's really awkward like bloodletting ritualistic sexual abuse a lot of pedophile rings and things like that so all of that contributes quite heavily 
to learn behavior because generally if you have somebody being used as a blood sacrifice they become psychologically numb to that pain right. it doesn't hurt them therefore when they do it to the next person that is just that's just the chain of command that's just what happens yeah that is life yeah, yeah. and that's how a lot of the more violent cults do sustain themselves you know you grow up in that it is accepted it is normal and you have this kind of romanticized view of well it happened to me and i'm okay yeah or am but i the, the reason the reason i think i i, I think it's important to ask these questions because the vast majority of people will not find themselves in such extreme circumstances but the psychological not maybe not psychological but the behavioral root of a lot of this stuff is kind of the same and yes there's um it tends to actually be when people are the victim of something it it tends to be a, a disproportionately large number of people go on to be perpetrators themselves, but also a disproportionately large number of people go on to do, to be advocates against it. So it's like, and and then you've got a, you've got these these you know the people that go on to to add to not have been affected either in a positive or a negative way by it is significantly yeah, just smaller. Exists. Yeah, and, and they're also- just existing is really dangerous, and that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand. That if you come out of that situation and you go on to offend, often it isn't necessarily a cry for help like it, it's made to seem in the media. But quite often it is. You know, that's the behaviour I've learned. That's that's what I know gets me from A to B. Yeah. Or you get the people that go on and they don't offend and they go that's a really bad thing that happened with me but it ends here and there's like um like tiktok and instagram videos where it's to really odd music and it's like a a woman that is you know she's a queen and it's the princess and every year that generational trauma carries through until somebody says no i'm gonna not let that happen to my daughter that's not going on and they just stop and they either get the help that they they need and that they deserve and they move on as don't they, I don't like saying functional human being because a lot of people are function without function without being yeah, well. Yeah. But they go on to be a well person, and then you get the people that kind of go, "Well, that wasn't normal, but I don't need anybody else." Mm. And they kind of carry on on that real flat line through life, and they're the people that really suffer because they don't get to experience the highs and lows of the emotion around that situation. They just they just travel on one continuum. So those are the people that in my mind, I would more be more inclined to want to search out because if somebody offends, then you know that you've got an access to the root of that offending. Mm -hmm. If somebody doesn't offend, you know, you've got somebody there that has the experience that you can learn from. If somebody's flatlining and nobody ever has a clue, then they're just seen as like a really heartless soulless expressionless person when actually inside they have this this need and this space where they are very aware that something isn't connecting Mm. but they just can't join those two bits up of themselves and they live two very separate realities and never even and experiences i never even thought about like that that fair group that just seemed to be kind of yeah it's just that middle because when you look I'm at a graph and i'm, people I'm one of those down. people that's like okay i went through all this bullying and abuse in school and therefore i now vehemently speak out against that type of stuff and will stick up for the little guy and you know and or you know guy girl non-binary pal it's like i will stick up for the the, the person that is in that position and then, but you do get a huge number of people that are up that without even, I think a lot of the times it's without even realizing it. Yeah. It's like, okay, I was, I was marginalized by this situation. And now I'm in a position of, I'm in a position of power of some description. So now I'm going to use that power. Like even within the streaming space, it's like you get a lot, like a lot of people like, because it's, it's, it's kind of addictive. The fact that you can ban people. Like I, when I'm up to date with chat, and someone comes in and shenanigans like the wrong kind of shenanigans we because we allow all kinds of bloody shenanigans around here but mm-hmm. when the we wrong kind of, when, when the wrong kind of shenanigans come in i want to be doing i want to do the ban myself like even even <laughs> muting people blocking people getting rid of people on social media a lot of those things can can like can become kind of like like a little power trip and this is me speaking yeah. from like my own experience this isn't me calling anybody else out although if you feel called out on this 
That's on you. <laughs> this is me. Introspection. This is me talking about the fact that when I first started banning people, I was like, oh, it's so liberating, this power. See, I don't do it. I don't. I, I don't hardly ever do it, but I, when I do it, I kind of like There's it. There's been one person in my chat who has been banned and they were banned by the only mod that I have um, who isn't even in all of my streams I mean I haven't streamed consistently for months but I have a mod who dips in and out for me and he was just like nope not having it not having that behaviour whereas I would just ignore it <laughs> um, it's like parenting you can't always give them the satisfaction <laughs> of the attention sometimes I just have to be like okay that's okay welcome hi I know, like, up for the challenge, he loves to play with trolls, doesn't he? Like, he I loves love to it. just... Yeah. And I, I just like, do you know what? As if... No, just be like, hi, welcome. Feel free to be yourself if you are, you know, a well-functioning human being. If you're not, and if you're going to say weird things when I'm talking about true crime or I'm playing Two Point Hospital, you, you can leave but you won't get what you want so bye <laughs> <laughs> but they just get my weird expressions when i'm playing two point hospital so that sort of leads us into kind of like where does what how what how do you scratch your your itch around your oh you didn't you did call obsession. it an obsession did, oh you did call it an obsession oh, it is, okay, they are obsessed I, I have I, to admit i'm okay I have, with admitting when mine's when some I, of my stuff's an obsession um how do you where, i don't how think do you i'll ever get a visa of um how do you have to scratch the itch of the forensic psychology obsession now if when when you work in business and networking and by the way you're freaking great oh. at that um but how do you scratch that itch now i just kept thinking the whole day like dave's gonna hate me dave no, is gonna hate me no. i am forcing him into uncomfortable situations and being like hi people talk today yeah no good like that's what i needed like for anyone I, I i don't i think i've talked about this on the podcast before now but i am <laughs> absolutely shocking in in networking situations and i mean i'm shocking in situations where people don't already know me when people you know just me sell yourself you're not you're not a, you're not a self um because i'm not as a look the, when i when that little quote that's on my twitter bio or my twitch bio that says i'm not here to tell you how awesome i am i'm here to show you how awesome you are that's because i live that that's like, that's not yeah. just a line. That is. So I took it the complete other way and was like, right, okay, if he's not going to sell himself, I will sell himself. And I, and I just. Yeah. <laughs> but that's so the thing. Don't, think, don't worry that I was ever, that I was ever bothered because I really wasn't. I had a great time there. I got my headshots. They're great, aren't they? <laughs> Are they good? Do you like them? Oh, yeah. I've, I've never worked with them before. Yet. I saw them on stream. I, I was like, lurking away. Okay, so when cool. you were like, these are the pictures I was like, oh, I need to see. <laughs> um, I haven't worked with Don before. He was a new photographer to us. Um, that was it. Was an interesting was thing good. to kind of add into it was the fun. conference. I'll bring I'll bring more outfits next time. <laughs> <laughs> bring like an entire rolling wardrobe. Yeah. Uh, so I I when I am streaming consistently, I do something called Murder Mum Day, which is where I talk about true crime, specifically murder, because I specialise in or always did specialise in ritual and occult behaviours and serial criminal activity. Um, which sounds really intense, and it is, and I yeah. don't recommend it for the faint of heart. I don't recommend it for the people that aren't aren't in there. But, you know, I when they used to say that you got a background search, when you got a visa to go to America and things like that, I was like, if they look at my Google history, they're never going to let me in the country. Um, because every day there'll be something I hear about, and I go, oh, I need to look that up. <laughs> so I'm there busy researching, like, mass murderers when I'm at a networking event. Um and I think a lot of it actually came. I mean, I always do this. I talk about something. I think, oh, I didn't talk about this. But my best friend, when I was about my daughter's age, slightly younger, his mum got murdered on Christmas Eve by her then partner. And I think that really is the the root of my of my need to know about why these things happen and how this becomes the case. So that wasn't a great situation as a young child it meant that I instantly lost my best and closest friend my mum had been his carer at school because he had a tracheotomy from something else dramatic that happened to him and he disappeared overnight and now when you search that crime you cannot find any media coverage on it any and it's almost like I dreamt it it's crazy but I am assured it did happen I have spoken to the police <laughs> about something completely different and was like do you know what and they're like no no we yeah no that did happen it was it was awful and I think that kind of set it off. So I do streams around it. So there is um, 
sometimes I do unsolved murders and we look at why they're unsolved and what kind of route you could take to solving them with modern psychological sciences and, and improvements in investigations. And sometimes I look at solved ones and I kind of go, do you know what they what they missed was X, Y, Z. And we tend to, we, me and my little strange murderino community, tend to look at um, specific cases in blocks. So we did one around historical cases so there is a case called who put bella in the witch elm <laughs> and i think i was in your chat the other week and i mentioned something about it and somebody was like oh my god i know that <laughs> I was like, first person i've ever met outside of my stream that knew anything about who put bella in the witch elm but that's um, like a central england thing where um, a woman's body was found inside a tree like inside a tree a hollowed out tree by some boys that were scrimping Mm-hmm. anybody international scrimping is stealing apples from orchards yeah it's, <laughs> it's some it's, kind it's of fr- weird it's frowned upon but not illegal or maybe it's illegal but not i don't know it's like <laughs> i think it's, it's the trespassing element that's illegal yeah yeah what i understand it's picking apples in somebody else's orchard and usually uh, yeah, so it'd be in somewhere involving a west country accent which yeah well this one was more like midlands more birmingham type people way, scrum I outside the west country i know outside of <laughs> bristol <laughs> Is there, um, is there anything else you want to add on this before we wrap up? Because we've already gone a little bit over. I know. Well, I looked at the time. I was like, oh, there's so much I know. More. <laughs> <laughs> like opening safe houses. Um, well, yeah, we didn't even talk about the that. Safe, no, we didn't even talk about human trafficking. And that's like my second mastermind topic. Have you got another 20 minutes? <laughs> if you see, I'm, I'm, you, I'm you it's, 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 um, it's Easter holidays, isn't it? You haven't got a school. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm I'm on holiday, annual leave. Um, right. Well, okay. Yeah, so in that case, in that case, it's a tell, whole other t- world. <laughs> tell tell me the safe house story, and then we'll wrap up. Because actually, so, the reason why I didn't get around to that because I thought I I in my head got that and the rehab center. Yeah. So they com- same charity, separate houses. So right. when you're a safe house, you have to be registered as a safe house. So you're not even allowed to get your staff picked up there. So if you work in a safe house, you can't tell your partner or your parents where it is you can't get taxis you can't do anything like that because you have to be away from the property to do it which is ironic then because both safe houses that I worked in were not in the best of areas to walk around at night as a young woman Mm -hmm. um yeah it was always interesting so I went from working in the rehab because I had this psychological experience I was asked to help support the lead on the safe house project so in the UK in about 2010, 2011, safe house work went out to tender and the Salvation Army won the contract, which in itself is a faith-based organisation. They then subcontracted to umpteen different safe houses and charities locally, well, I say locally, in the United Kingdom to then provide that care. And you were given a contract that you had to adhere to, which is where it all went tits up for where I work. (laughs) And essentially, so a safe house runs very much like a rehab project, but without necessarily the need for psychological intervention. So it is rescuing victims of human trafficking. And just to clear up, human trafficking is not international only. Uh, One of the worst cases we had was two young girls who were under the age of consent being trafficked from Barnsley to Sheffield. So it doesn't have to be far and it doesn't have to be overseas. Um, So it is it is intense and it's very it's very difficult work when you look at it remotely so we started a women's safe house in yorkshire so we obviously then received people coming in from raids on properties or that had been arrested for other crimes and it then unfolded in the criminal investigation that actually they were a victim of something much larger um, and things like that so with women it tends to be domestic servitude is the most frequent one and also sex trade so the sex trade is massive to just draw attention i think i mentioned this and you were like no at lunch but sex trade booms every four years yeah and it booms in the location of the olympic and paralympic games yeah yeah that was so you have it's it's odd do you know at the paralympics and the olympics it's where they give out like the most free condoms in such a short space of time because the athletes are all at it like rabbits after they've finished their events, of course, because... <laughs> um, yeah, well, if you're in the second week, sometimes that first week gets a bit lonely in the bubble. <laughs> so, so but, I mean, uh, it, it might seem obvious, but why does why does the sex trade boom? Is it just because of the influx of extra people to the Because there is a lot of people in one place mm. that are very easily entertained. And I say, 
That sounds mean. But you the supply, got a lot the of... The supply goes... Sorry, the demand goes up, so the supply... Yeah, massively. Yeah. So you, you will find a lot of sex trafficking rings will pull their women and men from around the, the locality into where those games are being hosted. So for London, for example, you had... Um, next to Westfield, you had the accommodation. So they basically built a town for the Olympics, and they do that in every location. So once you're an athlete, you get signed into the bubble and you do not leave. You are in the bubble till the end of the game. So they have food courts where you've got McDonald's and KFC and every global cuisine you can think of in one room that you can just eat to your heart's content, including ice cream. And then you've got flats where you're based primarily by country. So you, each country will have a set number of flats for their competitors. So, for example, for wheelchair rugby, which is the Paralympic discipline I was most involved in, we had three flats because we had so many competitors and staff. Mm -hmm. And then you have your health centre and all your shops and everything are in the bubble. You do not leave. But you then have a massive concentration of sports fans who are coming to one place to drink and watch sports. And the one common thing that people like when they've had a drink is some extra company. So, yeah, the demand is massive, male and female. So they get moved around and they yeah, get lots of pop-up brothels and things. It's unreal. It's, it's, it's mad, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then on the flip side, so that's female human trafficking. I then opened a men's house in the northwest. Um, so I went over for a week sourced an empty property, worked with the landlord, obviously to okay what it was going to be used for, furnished it, opened at about 8am, officially opened at 8am and by 9am we were full because we had been told that we needed to be open that day. So we opened that day and by 9am we were full because there had been a massive multi-agency raid on a work site where men were being kept in caravans and when I say caravan they're like stripped out caravans there was no bedrooms there was no kitchens no mm. bathrooms so it's a shell. and yeah. yeah basically just a porter cabin and fed various drugs and substances to keep them compliant to then work majoritively in the labor trade so construction work and not a word of English was spoken so then it's using language lines and getting the right certificates in place and getting the documentation done to get them health care to get them either repatriated or or work with them to stay in the uk obviously we've got closed borders now so it's a little bit different mm. but yeah open borders did nothing for human trafficking <laughs> we had like an oil heiress come through the house from russia that was an interesting one and then the biggest one that i worked on which is ongoing i think i mentioned about my chinese lady yeah who was on the run from the chinese government paid a loan shark to be smuggled to America, got left in England and then internally trafficked in the UK and then arrested. So you have to kind of pick back it's, through. It's just unreal that like you know, all of this is going on. Like, and it's mad. And the things that people use to keep them in the work is very similar to any other controlling relationship. So for a lot of African women that come over, it's ju juju bad juju is magic mm -hmm. and it's it's witch doctors and it's if you don't do this then i will tell them to do that and you know there must be a demon in your soul and we'll have to get the witch doctor to come and cast them out and you need to send money back to your family that's the main one for men is they think they're earning money that's being sent back legitimately to their home country to their family and it's not. so they're being kept and they believe that their wages are being sent back to their family and it, it's not no I mean, it's madness. There's, there's a lot I could ask, and then and the, you but know the main, they think the main, we abolished slavery and we never did. <laughs> just compartmentalised it, um, which literally leads to my kind of final question on this, is because there's so much I want to ask, but then I have to remember what's the purpose of this podcast, <laughs> and the purpose of this podcast isn't for me to just share um, what's the word I'm looking for, shocking stories. But although I mean, it's it's to you know help people out with things, and so the question I suppose to try and bring this back to something that maybe our audience can can use for themselves is how did you how did you compartmentalize all that how did you kind of seeing all that wow. know, taking on all that knowledge how did you um how did you go home and sleep at night i have a box in my brain 
It's yeah. overflowing now. So I might have several boxes, but I have a box in a filing. I mean, you talk to people and they're like, oh, you need to file it away. And you'll hear a lot in police training, particularly significant crimes. Um, when officers are doing anything, you know, you think of your brain as a filing cabinet and in the bottom drawer of the filing cabinet, right at the back, there's a file and you just never get to it because you're too busy going through everything else and mm-hmm. everything else is your operating system. So it's your autonomic nervous system. It's your fight and flight. It's all of your positive memories and it, it's ordered. So if you say it tends to the most positive memory you've got and zero is the most negative, you never get time to get to zero because you work through so much positivity before you get there that you either get bored or something else comes up or or you do something else and I do think I I'm not heartless it it pulls on my heartstrings when I hear those stories but I knew that in my job if I got too involved in that then I would get sucked in and that's always a risk you don't want to get sucked into somebody's situation because then you start expending what you have for you so you start expending your time and your money and your energy into trying to fix a situation for one person there's countless people in the UK you can't you can't sit and do that for everybody as much as you you would love to but you can help one person and you can help one person to get to the point where they can help themselves and then ultimately potentially help others and it's that kind of foreseeing the train so I knew that if I help this one person that actually seven degrees of separation I'm helping their family I'm helping their children I'm helping their future grandchildren their great-grandchildren their next generation to lead a different life to what they're in now yeah and that's kind of in my brain how I which I think is a bit extreme because a lot of people don't think that far ahead but I think that's part of my yeah quirky I mean, brain there was there was a, I had a sort of similar realization when um, when I was working with some other coaches, I was helping them out and I was saying, and like a lot of the things with coaches or anyone who's in a position where they help, like we can all, we can get a little bit hooked on giving the help. And then like, we like, it's really we, exciting. We like yeah. giving the help in that moment. And then we feel great for it and all the rest of it. But then with like that excitement fades or that feeling fades and you think I've really helped that person. And I remember saying to like one of my clients at once, I was like, look, when I when you get off the phone to me, does the stuff that we've talked about stop helping you the second you put down the phone? And she was like, "Of course it doesn't. It carries on." And this this client in particular is a personal trainer herself, and um, and I was like, and I was like, she's like, "Of course it doesn't. Like it, it, you know, um, it's stuff that I can work with. It's stuff that I, I know. It's stuff that like continues to help me and helps me with my clients and all the rest of it." I'm like, "Great." that's the same for you and your clients and it was one of those i'd never even twigged on it myself at that point i was i took a i took a bit of a gamble because imagine if i said to it you know when when we put up the phone fo- hang up the phone at the end of this conversation do i stop being of use to you when i'm not actively helping in that moment and imagine if she just said actually yeah <laughs> i'd have been like, like yeah it doesn't matter after that i'd have been like, like, like okay never mind then i'm going now and i'm going to reconsider my life choices but it was that thing of like um, and almost the flip side of when we were doing the charity stream last week, and I'd just been listening to a suicide researcher on the Proper Mental podcast. It's like I'm uh, I'm currently trying to think of how many of his guests I'm going to steal. Um, but basically, <laughs> I've been listening to this suicide researcher talk about the fact that they estimate that that, that an average of seventy five people are impacted by every suicide. So it's like you know you're looking at the seven degrees of separation there. It's like well every person that ha- the, what happens in their life impacts on average about seventy five people. And like, yeah, so so the the, the extension of you, you change the trajectory for one person and they take a completely different path, like all that impact it has on other people. And it's, it's amazing. It's um, collateral beauty is the phrase for it. We always talk about collateral damage. That's pretty. Yeah. Um, it's called collateral beauty. And it's way we, people often know the phrase collateral damage because negative stuff gets more oppressed, but collateral beauty, like it's what the, the impact of what of of what you do like goes far beyond what you do and in fact actually my video on karma that's like years old now it's a little animation on youtube and it's a i don't believe in karma is in i do something nice for you and you do something nice for me in return i believe it in it i do something nice for you that positively impacts your day and then you're more likely to do more nice for someone else and and then yeah. and that continues on and therefore eventually there's more good in the in, in the world because of it's that. a bit like the pay it forward, pay it forward theory, exactly, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's you like do something for someone, but you don't want any, you don't want anything back, but you want them to 
carry that feeling and that ethos forward it's a really funny one because I don't sit down and think oh well who's helped me and I think that's probably the one bit of work that I need to do on myself is I would say oh the people that have helped me are my solicitor because they got the outcome that was legally right but I wouldn't I've not seen a therapist although I probably should um for any of the stuff that I went through with my ex-husband I mean I don't talk I'm not I'm not a closed book on it but I just don't choose it as my first topic of conversation now whereas when we first left my daughter would tell everybody and I mean every cast member at Disneyland everybody at Morrison's knows exactly why we were with granddad and not with daddy right (laughs) and it was we don't live with daddy because daddy hits mummy (laughs) and I can smile about it now I think it's a bit of an awkward smile but you know ultimately she literally saved my life in that situation by telling school what was going on Mm. and that's a whole different story um but the I don't sit down and think right who's feeding into me because I'm very focused on feeding out to others and I probably should at some point go right what do I need and I'm quite lucky in the respect that I think I just kind of absorb I'm like a plant (laughs) I think I just I think I just take in what I need from the atmosphere and just leave everything else and just try and put out something that's better well as a as a person as, as a person who also is great at giving the help not so great at the receiving it and who is currently learning to receive it i mean there's been plenty of people that have helped me along the way um but you know i think the the thing that put me off is i did something um i did a, a course I, I don't think it's actually called surviving the narcissist but essentially it's a, a, a recovery gist. group <laughs> but you, you do like 12 sessions and all of a sudden you're healed and you're never going to choose another red flag relationship in your life kind of thing and there's a child equivalent which is something like the flowers course or something like that and it's too airy fairy for me i don't think kids are flowers kids are kids um <laughs> you've just called about, yourself a plant yeah um, well yeah i am yeah i'm not i'm just calling you out and you mixed mess shiny now. <laughs> i just turned to the sun you see that's why that's why i'm so positive because like i just turn flower. towards the positivity sunflowers are my favorite flower actually oh uh, well they do turn towards the sun yeah, yeah. um so I'm carry anyway. myself <laughs> one minute you did Let six sessions and you're no longer and you and oh yeah so it was like 12 sessions long and about four sessions in i was like i don't know if i can be bothered to still go into this like is it really helping me to know what the red flags are. I'm pretty sure that even if I saw the red flags again, I would maybe potentially make different decisions, but I might just make the same decisions and repeat history. And then at the end, I was like, oh, actually, I think I just kind of sucked in the knowledge that I needed because afterwards I felt a lot more confident in being able to recognize those negative relationships yeah. um, and setting boundaries. But I'm not great. I'm not great at boundaries because I like to help people and I like to... so. And then I've got social anxiety, which you wouldn't believe now. And that was the thing I wanted to finish on. Like, now you wouldn't believe that I have crippling social anxiety when I'm out and about. But I feel like this is something that I know and that I'm good at. And then at work, you've obviously seen work, Rachel. Um, and I get all of my confidence from my job but because I know that I'm good at my job. Yeah. Like, like you said, you know, about networking and things. I am like a sponge and I suck up all those little facts like, oh, he's got a dog or he's got two kids or he played semi-professional rugby or... The first two of those are true, by the way. The random... third one is not to do. <laughs> I did not play like, semi-professional rugby. Like they're those random rugby. little facts and so that I know that I can connect people with people that will impact them positively, whether that's through like the the relationship being more friend-based or whether it's a professional relationship where I think actually the organization that this second person is with needs to know about the first person and just give them that hook. Um, But yeah, I just think I'm a bit of an odd, I am an odd one. And I think ever since I stopped masking, I am, I get weirder by the day and I don't apologize for it. But yeah, it makes life the fun. weird was always there. <laughs> and the same with you. No, it was always there. Just a the, little and, the weird, and, and look, look, there's no such thing yeah. as normal. Remember, everybody's weird. We just think of everyone. We think find of people who are normal as being the same brand of weird that we are. <laughs> same. I like that same brand, cut from the same cloth. Yeah. Um, I was trying to look for something that kind of suggests my um, uniqueness. But other than my chaos, I can't really see anything. But I suppose my chaos is my uniqueness. And it is, when I say chaos, I mean, this is after a quick tidy up. But I live in pure chaos and I love it. I love my own brand of chaos because at least I know where I am. (laughs) Yeah, good. 
and that's a that's a big thing you know i'm now that i'm comfortable in my chaos it's probably worse for anybody visiting my house than it has ever been because i don't do the whole somebody's coming speed clean and i don't they walk in and i'm like welcome to my house this yeah. is our brand of chaos like, and if you don't like it go back to honestly, your brand honestly <laughs> i if, if you're judging somebody over the fact that the house is is messy what is that about like i mean i could like i i don't and like i don't have that pressure but i do have that pressure because a loner can't let people see the house like we're that. anti-social so we don't let people in well i've got but no choice the I'm, few I'm people that come in oh no like how do you find that uh, ryan's worse than it's me it's all right actually it's all it's, like, it's 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 all right now it wasn't all right when I was when I was hiding the fact that I had social anxiety, but as soon as as soon as we, I would as soon find as I had, it so exhausting. It is exhausting, but we're, but also she she knows that and she knows we that, keep it like, to a select few. And when I say a select few, it like they're either blood relations <laughs> oh, or not. like Ryan's one best friend. I was going to say I spend and even less time with those now. <laughs> when they come, in. well that's Sorry, it on Ryan's mom, side. No, we have side. Ryan's little sister here at the minute. She's staying tonight. She's eighteen soon, and she's like, oh, I'm eighteen soon. I'm a grown up. I can. Vote. Do everything Actually, that my is she, is she, mother and stepfather before the vote comes <laughs> June. i'm not even sure when the vote is i've got my poll cards out on my desk it's may oh uh, you know she's 18 oh that sucks she's 18 in june i could have <laughs> encouraged her to use her hard one right to vote um but we have like a rule in our house and it is make yourself at home or go home so we have a cupboard that has no doors on that has all our cups and glasses in everything is in really obvious places and it's not just obvious for us because sometimes the, the obvious place for other people is not the obvious place for me yeah. so we have moved some of the kitchen round to make it slightly more social uh what's the right word generally accepted as a so- social yeah, socially yeah. accepted as i've lost my I can't remember. I, I know anyway, so like the it. spoons are in the cutlery is in the top drawer, not like halfway down the dining table and stuff like that. Whereas I would put it in the dining table because that's where we sit and eat. Yeah. Um, and you know, first time you come, we'll show you where the bathroom is, we'll show you where the TV remote lives, and we'll show you where the cups and glasses are. The next time you come, you fend for yourself. <laughs> is that the TV remote on the edge of that little table over there? Um, that is one of them. Yeah, yeah. I found it. I, I'm, 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 I'm hey, you're welcome anytime now, Rachel. I'm going to need to wrap us up because we've done I an know, hour I'm and a half. Sorry. And hey, look, okay. it's, it's, this is what happened. No, this, this is what happens when 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 we get two neurodivergent people <laughs> at the same time. It's a uh, follow the same tangent at least. Interesting enough, like the person, who, like, like you, we'll still be able to use this e- this episode. Un- unlike the first time I introduced Beat Cleaver, who did raid about um, twelve minutes ago. I saw Beat come in. Yeah, we're, we're, thank you for the raid, Beat. I can actually say. <laughs> <laughs> um but um but yeah when when me and b cleaver did it the first time the first conversation of ours we couldn't use it it was it was two and a half really? three hours and it was just tangent after tangent and i loved every minute of it but i'm like no one is following this like <laughs> yeah i'm really sorry for anybody who listens to the end and thinks what the i heck i know I think, I think i think i think we've done, I think we've done <laughs> well i think we've done well um is there is if people want to check you out on what you do and where you are and all that where's I'd the best say you can do? find me on twitch i'm usually lurking in somebody's chat um, i i am going to try and get back to streaming because i do enjoy it because i get to pull funny faces and say funny things at two point hospital if not talk about murder and play words on stream so that's basically like my career on twitch oh you can find me on instagram it's rachel and the littles thinking of a rebrand because i'm not so sure if i want to keep the and the littles because i have had some people get confused as to whether or not i have did and it's right. just my small humans i thought it was um, you were going to get people from like fat life coming over and <laughs> it's my hobbits really <laughs> <laughs> um no it's my small humans and on there we share a lot of i'm trying to do more speaking um, you inspired me to kind of step outside of my comfort zone a little bit and do more speaking because people do like when I speak although I seem to get more and more southern the more I speak um, I do live in Yorkshire believe <laughs> people don't believe me generally you know nothing John Snow <laughs> no nothing but yeah Yorkshire is its own dialect every place needs its own dictionary like Barnsley's dictionary is different to Sheffield's dictionary is different to Wakefield's dictionary and I'm still getting over the fact of the term Wessel Cups I don't even, I'm not even under this term. What is a Wessel Cup? I don't know. What is a Wessel Cup? It's a bauble, apparently, on a Christmas tree. That's weird. I'm playing with a ball right now. I've been fidgeting the whole time, and I'm, I've literally shredded a piece of paper in front of me. So apologies if I look I like I'm was playing constantly. with snake balls before, and I hope it didn't jingle too much, because snake balls makes this noise. I couldn't hear him. That's what noise snake balls makes hear. when I play with snake balls. I didn't hear balls. anything then. Oh. I didn't hear, literally didn't hear anything. Cool. 
That must mean that Zoom's got a better um, noise cut I have got original sound off. Right. Okay, so Zoom been... for you. The stream sound. will have heard it probably. Right, on that note. So, it's yeah, been absolutely so you can lovely. find me there. Or you can just, just Mum thirty one, by the way, on Twitch. She said find me on Twitch and then didn't actually mention the name. Uh, yeah, just Mum thirty one. I've considered a rebrand on that as well, because you keep telling me I'm more than just Mum. Way more. So much more. But I didn't have anything <laughs> else interesting to call myself. Uh, <laughs> so. I'll, I'll I'll think of a rerun for you. I'll forget. But yeah, somebody but somebody think of a new name. Yeah. We'll have a competition in the Discord. Murder she re- rage. S- somebody rebrand me. Murder she rage. Um, but thanks for having me. This has been really fun. <laughs> She's not picking up on that one. Uh, it's been. Do, do, if I could be Jessica Fletcher for the day, I'd, I'd love it. But, like, but I also want a job on the arches, so I don't know if that would clash with oh, yeah, my yeah, schedule. I, I, I remember you saying that the other day. Right. Um, thank you for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. This will be <laughs> up in about nine days or something. 